Um, thank you all for joining us today. It's really a privilege to actually get to introduce Gene Shin, and we've been working together on this project for over 18 months. So I'm going to do the brief kind of quasi-bio, but Gene Shin transforms large accumulations of everyday objects into elaborate and labor-intensive sculptures and site-specific installations, giving new forms to discarded materials. Born in Seoul, raised in Maryland, and currently living in New York, her practice begins with place and site. She often solicits donations for, from participants within a specific community or locale, and she explains this saying, I seek to recall an object's past, as well as suggest its greater connection to our collective memories, desires, and failures. Jean attended Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine and received a BFA and MS from New York's Pratt Institute. And she is also tenure adjunct faculty of fine arts at that institution. And she has shown, I feel like she has shown almost everywhere. Uh, but her solo exhibitions have taken place at New York's Museum of Modern Art, as well as a recent solo exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and in 2009 at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art in DC. And she recently completed a landmark commission called Elevated for New York City's new Second Avenue subway line, which for me as a New Yorker, I feel like I've waited my whole entire life for that line to be built with family who has lived on Second Avenue and 37th Street, always having to walk to Grand Central. Still doesn't quite reach, but I really applaud you for that because it's personally meaningful. Uh, we have a few thank yous that we kind of have to do in terms of this exhibition. And we wanted to take a moment to thank Jamie Crusson for working with Jean to organize the fabrication of elements of the installation here on the West Coast. So thank you, Jamie. And actually, we will embarrass you by asking you to stand up. No, yes, there we go. I also wanted to thank California College of Art professors Josh Fott and Ranu Mukherjee. And there were a number of art students, both on the East Coast from SUNY New Paltz and here in San Francisco at CCA, at San Francisco Art Institute and San Francisco State University who lent their talents and labor to this exhibition. I'd also like to thank James Cow of Green Citizen, which is an electronic recycling company in the south of San Francisco, and they sourced and organized and delivered the materials to be upcycled into this installation, and specifically two of the staff there, Christopher Dunfield and Nicholas Ye for their and their colleagues for managing this highly, highly, highly labor-intensive process. Just to give you a sense, I think over 3,000 cell phones and over 20 miles of cables, which is huge. So we really couldn't have done that without their effort. And just a little shout out to my colleagues here at the Asian Art Museum. There is no exhibition that happens here just by one person. And there are so many people who labored here today to make it happen. So without going into so many names, I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, when thinking about how to introduce this, this program and this conversation, it reminded me of an opening of a New York Times article by Jenna Wortham about what we expect from popular culture. And she wrote, it feels like we're living in the end times, but rather than relying on popular culture as an escape hatch, a vacation from reality, we seem to be learning, leaning into television shows, movies that imagine the inevitable outcome to our current political and ge geological climate as a dystopia. And working on this exhibition with Eugene over the course of however long, I thought about this question. What do we need from culture right now? And what is a 
what is the value about imagining these inevitable outcomes? So I kind of wanted to start the conversation there. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so I guess in relationship to that quote, you're talking about the dystopia. Is that the outcome, the, the outcome of dystopia? Yeah, or leaning into leaning. like what we're facing now. Like mm -hmm. it might be, I might mm -hmm. lean, not talk about dystopia because it's actually happening, mm -hmm. but we're leaning into this anxiety. We're leaning into the, the reality of our politics and climate change. Mm -hmm as opposed to, for our culture, as opposed to an escape mm -hmm. from that current reality. Mm -hmm. And what's the value in that? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that question is very related to my practice because um, I'm using objects um, from culture uh, that's been discarded. And I th feel like um, for me to present that reality in a public space um, is, is very much reinserting our value system. Um, and part of that is we're in a highly consumer-based culture, um, so much about the disposability of everything we own, everything we use, um, and not really valuing that they're part of our lived experience. And so much of it um, has both our desires, but also our failures uh, embedded in these objects. And so to um, re-examine them, um, to bring them back as materials and repurpose them to, uh, for art making purposes. I'm presenting a reality um, that is both uh, known and something that's very accessible to people. Oh, that's my stuff, that's my waste, that's my leftover, the thing I threw out. Um, and so by examining the waste um, of things that we discard, we're really um, looking into our history, right? And kind of mining that history to imagine what has happened. Right? Um, so that in looking at the past, I think we can examine what um, our present reality and our choices are um, to perhaps imagine a better future. Right? So um, unlike dystopia, I'm thinking of an optimistic uh, look um, by looking at the things that we have left behind. So in the hope that things can actually change and that there is actually optimism in that change. I kind of wanted to situate <laughs> your work. So for many of us who might just be coming across this exhibition as our first experience with some of your work, uh, I was wondering if you could maybe take us through a handful of projects. And this one is entitled Chance City. And that, could you tell us a little bit about the work and the process that you sure. took Sure. Um, Chance City is an early work that I did. Um, and it's $32,000 um, and change of uh, lotto tickets that have all been used and discarded. Um, so I would collect them literally on the street as I walk from my studio to home um, and imagine like, oh, this in this object embedded a certain economy uh, and the person who might have used it, imagining that they would win instantly a million dollars or something, and yet the next second would be that you have actually lost, right? So I just love this idea that this object could be both full of optimism and then incredibly pessimistic that you're a loser. <laughs> for having spent your money. Um, and I realized that that was kind of the same path that I had when I was a young artist going to the studio, like full of optimism, going to the studio, I'm gonna make art, it's gonna be so great today. And then defeated, coming home and be like, God, I just wasted so much time, materials, labor. It's true, this is rigged, I'm never gonna make good art, I'm never gonna be a good artist, you know. So it just seemed like all the risk that you take um, doesn't, um, help you learn those lessons. Um, and that despite the odds of winning or um, feeling that that was possible, we did it anyway, right? And so in that way, I really believed that it's a belief system, it's a value system that I believe in art making and that it didn't matter if I was wasting the time every day. One day it was gonna manifest. So the city um, was very much that. It's a house of cards, so there's no glue. It's just balanced vertically, horizontally. So it's friction, it's gravity, it's the laws of our lived experience uh, that holds it together. And it's the, um, not the in instant um, building, but really investment in time and labor. So in conversation before, you talked about, well, one thing that you had mentioned is you collected these on the walk from, your, from home to your studio and back. Mm -hmm. 
but you also collected them in other ways, if I remember that. Yeah, so then when I decided after a small installation, I was con contacting my local bodegas, and I'm like, oh, could you save some, and so on. And then, of course, my parents were asking, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm collecting lotto tickets. And he's like, I sell lotto tickets. <laughs> I pick up lotto tickets every day. So my parents in DC were um, owning a supermarket store and consequently a liquor store. And so they were like, let me just hook you up. I can call all my Korean business owners and they pick up lotto tickets every day from their counter. So you're just doing their work. So uh, for a year, this whole community was activated to um, collect and not throw away their trash, but to mail them to me. So when Jean actually came to the museum and had meetings with all of our staff and actually talked about this project, there's a question about uh, materials and in, in the actual material section it says no adhesive. And my colleagues, especially in registration, their jaws dropped open because they were like, well, what happens if they fall? What do you do? How do you, how do you deal with it? And if you can actually see in this detail right over here, it shows some of that collapse. Mm -hmm. So this work is dated with two different years. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk about that and... Well, each time it's installed, um, it's sort of a performance. It's a private performance we do during install, right? Because it can never be recreated the same. It's always a different number, a different building, a different, you know. Um, so in that way, um, it changes. And every single time it's dated as the time it was shown, you know. Um, and so the one on the right is shown at the Brooklyn Museum. The one on the left um, was shown at the Smithsonian. Um, so each time it's a different context. And I have to say, when I showed it at the Smithsonian, it was 89. It was right after the market crash. So everyone was thinking not about buildings and architecture. When I built it, it was right after 9-11. So we were all thinking about different things. Uh, but we were talking about the fundamental ideas of econom economics, um, what, what propels our um, optimism, you know, in believing in structures that are um, supposed to be stable and then being undermined by that. Um, so it's the same uh, idea about these kind of numbers and what's at risk, uh, what's stable, what seems to be go moving too fast, knowing that there's a bubble, you know, that's going to eventually crash, right? So I think that uh, the metaphor, the lotto ticket, seemed just perfect, um, but it had a very different reading when shown in 2009. Yeah. And it has in previous years. And I think that one of the reasons I found it so compelling was thinking about living here in San Francisco. Um, and that question about hearing these mythologies about, oh, just wait for the next tech bubble to burst, wait for the next earthquake, everything is going to stabilize and rebalance, X, Y, and Z. Um, but I'm not sure if that will happen. Okay, the, nec the next work we actually talked about or would like to talk about is Unravel. And that was actually shown here in the Bay Area, if I'm not. Yeah, it was shown correct. in the Berkeley Art Museum in the former space, <laughs> the Brutalist Building. Um, yeah, it was an exhibition that started at Asia Society um, as part of um, a, a great exhibition called One Way or Another. Um, and actually, Suzette Min, who was here, was, uh, um, had curated, one of the curators there. Um, so the question that was asked by the curator was whether this generation of artists were using identity-based works. And so um, at the time, it was like an interesting question to be posed, and I said, well, maybe I will create my first identity-based work, <laughs> but with a question mark. Um, so instead of it being about my own identity, I wanted to talk about like what is the show really trying to do and how are they reaching out and having this sort of, quote, survey of Asian American art practices. So I asked the curator to give me their sweaters and they all happen to be Asian Americans. Um, and then they reached out to their community who they felt would um, be part of the community at large. Um, so they they gave me their sweaters. So then I deconstructed the sweaters and um, unraveled them. Um, and so their networks were something I wanted to make visible. And I was really curious, like, do I know people in, in the 
am I central to the Asian American community? Do I know people who are central or am I really off on the side? Or how many people know people? Like, are we really a community that bands together? Like all those questions. Um, and how much do we self-identify as being part of an Asian American community? Um, and so that was a question that was asked and each person who contributed their sweater kind of went through their own processing of what did that mean for them and then decide to participate or not. Um, and then the project moved city to city and more more participants joined. So I think we started in New York, maybe 60 sweaters, and it's almost up to 200 um, participants, uh, most recently shown at the Philadelphia Museum. Um. So again, another installation that has, was installed in 2006 and a little bit thereafter, and then reinstalled in 2018. Were there any elements of that central question that you just talked about that have shifted or changed? Oh. Or was it kind of kind of similar in that way? Um, there's a lot of things that have changed. Um, so I think it started in 2006, and um, for people, the issue around, well, I'm Asian, you know, heritage, but I don't have a citizen, so am I Asian American? I'm sort of living in New York, you know, that, those questions, you know. So when do you become American? Uh, is it a passport issue? Is it just a cultural issue? Is it that you've stayed long enough to self-identify with American culture? Um, so there are a lot of issues around that, and I think it's gotten more poignant as, as um, immigration statuses are really questioned, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's got, become extremely politicized, for sure. But it was also around, like, how do we know each other as a network? Um, and I think in um, 2006, like, I think my space was, like, the only community digitally. Otherwise, you knew people. <laughs> like, you physically and mentally knew them, and uh, you met them. And now people say, oh, I know that person. It's like, uh, through Facebook. And I'm like, do I know you? Uh, you're my Facebook friend. And I'm like, OK. Do I know you? <laughs> you know, so it's a very different community, right? And yet I, I could look them up and realize, oh, I've seen their posts or I know where you vacationed. And so I think how we know each other has really changed and what we um, know as a community. At the time, I didn't know who knew who. And now it's very much what we post, like how, who's friends with who and who liked what. And so that community has become like a status. Um, and I think back in the day, it was just what you did to survive, I think. You know, we need communities, and that's what I was really getting to. Like, I survived a certain way, but there's certain people I know, but is it central, and how many degrees of separation are we from the cr critical people who are the connectors? Mm. And I really, through this project, learned, like, you pretty much need to know like a few individuals in that Asian American community because they know everyone. So it's the gateways. <laughs> yes, the gatekeepers. I figured out who the gatekeepers are. <laughs> um, so a logistical question. How did you keep track of these relationships? Like what, what system did you employ? An Excel sheet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really re literally have an Excel sheet that is monstrous and has been updated. Um, but the, we did not try to update it in 2018 because then people would go and say like, but now I know more people because of all the social media. And so we just didn't, it was when the project invited you who you knew, not when it continues to evolve. So like you're, you're hi creating a hierarchy about like in real life, relationships versus and at the time social that media. you gave me the sweater and you're part of that network so it's just i find it super interesting because in terms of our social media environment it was exactly a year before the invention of facebook right. which was in 2007 right. so i was just like Whoa. yeah for me it's a real archiving of our relationships and i think that's really special um, because we kind of forget. Um, I mean, there's so many overlapping communities tonight, like so many New Yorkers, so many people that I met in different shows, and that's beautiful, you know? And we, we sort of forget, but it's really nice to kind of remember that entry point when we first met and when we first had that, like, impression of being friends and being part of a, uh, a mutual community. Okay, uh, let, let's move on to the next project. Um, I guess Celadon Landscape mm -hmm. is the title of this work. What, what are we looking at in these um, images? So these are process images, and um, 
this is an interesting project to look at in relationship to uh, unraveling, um, because in some ways about bringing uh, the Korean uh, Asian American communities and thinking about that. But in this project, um, when I was asked um, to do a commission with MTA, it was my first commission with MTA um, years ago. Um, it was in Flushing, Queens, and so it's a predominantly Asian American, specifically Korean American community that's very uh, dominant. And so I thought, well, what if it, I did a reverse commute and I sent myself to Korea for the materials as opposed to tapping the community there? Um, so in that mindset, I thought of uh, what would I present to this community like a gift of public art? And I just thought um, that the Korean Celadon was the most prized um, ceramic um, um, cultural heritage object um, and that I could go and um, find this discard, uh, the trash of ceramics uh, in Korea to bring back and give to, as a present to New York City. So here I'm um, working with different potteries, um, ateliers who have agreed to give me the ceramic waste. Um, so this um, atelier in had like generations of ceramic uh, celadon production going on. And what was so fascinating was it's a tradition that's so hard to master and that they could keep that tradition going for centuries. And um, so in their production, 40 to 60% um, is lost because something goes wrong in the process. So something's not perfect, the glaze isn't right, something cracks, um, so they have to destroy it. Um, so all this waste is produced by the artists and sanctioned because they don't want anything that's not like perfect to leave their shop. And when I saw um, their you know, studio, when I went to the back of the studio and saw this uh, broken landscape um, of their discards and fragmentations, I thought it was the most beautiful landscape ever. And so that was the inspiration for the project is to import these broken, um, imperfect uh, vessels and then bring them back to make art. You had, in our conversation before, had mentioned something like, you were you're overwhelmed and impressed and it almost was this kind of archaeology yeah. and layers of these shards. It was like going back in time um, and witnessing uh, the, all these uh, masters, you know, um, who then decided that these were not right. Um, and I just said, but they're perfect, you know. And I think to me it was really questioning um, the metaphor around the Korean Celadon, which was so prized, and how my relationship to Korea is that I've left, uh, not by choice, but as a child, my family immigrated. Uh, so when I return to Korea or I'm in Korean communities, everyone's trying to question, how Korean are you? Like, which part of the fragmented piece are you whole? Do you speak the language? Do you celebrate blah, blah, blah? You know, it's like this kind of degrees of. Um, and so I just thought this was um, a perfect metaphor for the diaspora of Korea, that we're all part of this DNA somehow, or reliving that tradition, even if we're a fragment of it. Um, so I did want to bring a wholeness. So you could go to that. So speaking of wholeness, uh, so this is an installation that in Saratoga, Florida? It's in Sarasota, uh, Florida now, but it was uh, conceived in Dallas at a, uh, the Crow Collection of Asian Art. Um, and really, again, uh, looking at collections, and they did not have a strong um, Korean art collection. And so um, Kern had is thought it would be interesting to look at the two traditional Korean vases and introduce a, a contemporary Korean artist to look at that. And so we thought of making these monumental vases that would be, quote, in the or Zen garden as if you discovered these these relics um, and discovered how beautiful they were. But also fragmented and you still maintain the discovery that you had when you found the shards. Yeah, and you see the broken pottery and you wonder why they're broken. Right. And how big are these? How would you describe um, their size? They're about eight foot um, um, vessels, but they're shifted in, in, in different positions in the landscape. And so the last work we're going to talk about is MetaCloud, which is 2018, right? And it was a Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, uh, which these are amazing installation photos just in terms of the accumulation, but 
What is what? What was this project? Um, so MetaCloud is, um, believe it or not, a 35 millimeter slide collection from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so talking about institutions, uh, we're in this amazing um, museum, right? And the Met pretty much typifies like the museum um, historically. Um, and so um, when they decide to discard their um, side archive because it's no longer needed, and it makes sense, no one's distributing 35 millimeter slides or asking for them. So their slide library was dismantled. They've been holding on to these slides, digitizing them and putting them up in the clouds and so on. And I just, um, they one day just said, it's, it's enough. We got to get rid of these slides. Um, so so I was tapped along with some other artists to go through and make a project. And so I asked the other artist to go through first and said, whatever you don't use, I will use the rest of it because I'm really interested in the archive itself, this whole idea of institutional memory that is implanted in this material. And what does it mean when we no longer need slides or need to um, live with them? And what does it mean that it's gone into the cloud? So I wanted to create an installation where you could physically feel like you're in the cloud with these slides. Um, and the question around like what what gets lost in the translation moving from di for analog to digital and our technology and also classification and metadata and so actually i don't know if you can actually read it here but it has all of that information of what exhibition what year where it was and gives you the archival information of the history of the met and yeah, it's also um, the hand notes that the librarians would take, and I love that because it's like the people who took care of this history and who uh, made sure that they were being digitized and which were popular, you know, making dupes. Remember when images actually had degradation between the master and the copy, and the first copy oh, and the they second still copy? Have that. <laughs> they still have that, JPEGs and TIFFs and so on. But we assume it's, it's just readily um, available, right? Um, with Without care, and the librarian's work is to catalog them. Um, and without these slides and the exhibition history, it's also uh, documenting the back of house. You know what was happening in conservation, what was happening with art installations, and you know um, just photos of events and things like that. So it really was institutional memory uh, that was trapped in these um, slides. So I guess we'll move into the exhibition downstairs. Stairs. Um, so this was probably the most intimate ongoing conversation that I've ever had with an, another artist. And one of the things about your practice is that, that, that interest in sight and not being from the Bay Area or having lived in the Bay Area. What were the things about the Bay Area that interest you and what were the things that you discovered? Um, well, I think you can't um, escape the tech history here. Um, so Silicon Valley seems to be, and I mean, technology seems to be the session or new reality. So um, doing a project in this area and knowing that the community would somehow be tech related and a majority might have a history here. Um, so that was fascinating. And I was already working with a lot of e-waste um, and, and technology, like old technology and obsolete technology. So I was really curious about introducing a project and what that would feel like to this community that were so embedded in the early history of invention and, and computers and the internet and uh, the apps and so on, everything that drives us today. Um, and then, of course, my memory of visiting San Francisco is this beautiful landscape that we don't have so much in New York and, and the city itself. So, um, so I wanted to talk both about the landscape and technology as uh, important aspects. Um, and I think you were talking about the counterculture movement, like how you know it really came um, as as the the, uh, the the environmental movement was just as important. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was really interesting as as that that fascination with with the tech culture that so much of policy here actually has deep roots in, in activism and, and you know, California and the Bay Area being the first to outlaw plastic bags, I guess now with straws, and et cetera, but it actually has like a deep, deep history. So I was really interested when you were mentioning that and thinking about the climate change, how these both 
these two forces exist in the same space simultaneously for 40, 50 years. Um, just because everybody talks about like, oh, tech innovation, you're in near the heart of Silicon Valley. And, and how do we deal with this dissonance? Yeah, I think we, in our conversation, realized there was a real paradox of living here um, that seems those two dimensions collapse. You know, it's a really complex relationship um, around technology and nature. You know, um, and I've always thought deeply about the environmental impact of um, my own practice, but also just in general, a lot of my projects um, were driven by um, looking at objects and where they go, where they come from. Um, so I felt like in San Francisco, those two conversations um, kind of could um, try to reconcile itself. Oh, so, so here we actually, like, we embarked on the project and talking about e-waste, and one of the, the challenges was getting these materials. Can, can you tell us about the ways that we actually sought them yeah, out? So so usually it's the first call is like uh, work with institution and they reach out to, I'm sure you got a newsletter e-blast saying, hey, Gene Shin's looking for um, um, old tech. Um, so we had a call out for um, phones uh, and we got quite a number, but not enough to make this massive installation. I wouldn't really want to overwhelm people with the level of um, e-waste um, and the obsolescence of phones that we have lived through in the last 20 years. And so that call, um, though it brought participants into the project and I'm always interested in kind of opening up the creative process so people feel very invested in it up front um, but then really having found Green Citizen as a partner where they donate this is their work as they process so much of the e-waste collecting them from corporations individuals and so on and recycling them um, for me finding a partner that was really mission aligned you know uh, diverting e e-waste from the landfills was an important component. And I had no idea this uh, very small company has a huge impact. The number of phones that we were able to get in the months and the number of cables um, really spoke to the ne necessity of their work, you know. And actually, the business of recycling is actually really difficult business. Um, so it was really interesting having them as a partner and actually we went down to their business and we were overwhelmed both by their passion and the amount of things that were available. And they talked about the usage of all of these things and how it's difficult to recycle because it's proprietary and you never know what's in these things. They actually had some of like the bird scooters outside being like, I don't even know how to recycle this. We don't even know what it's made of and we need to follow all these regulations. And seeing, seeing their passion to figure that out was really quite amazing. Yeah, and it's interesting to imagine that, um, you know, James, who founded it, started as a programmer, you know, and so he was involved in the making of and realized in, in his life, like, wait, what's happening? So I, I love that questioning, and I think that that's exactly what the exhibition has been really be, being about, you know, um, kind of questioning the ethics and accountability to the innovators and people who were involved in designing these softwares and programming these new apps and saying, actually, that may be a good thing, but we're forgetting that it also creates a chain of events for other things, which is the loss of our phones and having to constantly upgrade, you know, and what's happening with the e-waste. So the, the other thing that kind of came up as we we're beginning this conversation is uh, you said that, you know, I've been thinking a lot about Scholar's Rocks, and I've always wanted to make a work that engages that, and you, you were talking about Korean scholar shocks. I actually had to do a little bit of research to understand the difference between Korean scholar shocks, which are seemingly much more round and, um, I guess, horizontal versus vertical, but it was something that was really important to you to think about these forms, and, and I'm kind of curious what in, 
what intrigued you about the form and, and the tradition of the scholar rock? Um, well, I guess I would zoom out a little bit and say that uh, sort of the obsession around uh, looking at rocks um, as representation of nature, you know, um, um, that was so interesting and that there's a, sort of a cultural obsession around that, you know. my. My father always goes on every hike, every trip, and he's like picking up a rock. And I realized I was doing the same thing. I go to the beach picking up a rock. And it's both symbolic of that journey and that, that walk, but it's also then really examining that rock very closely because you're choosing that rock versus the million other pebbles and things like that. And so I think that we um, find ourselves in it and find beauty in it and to examine what that means and that it's a space for us to focus on. Um, and that has been the truth tradition with Scholar's Rocks, that it um, represents nature, the essence of nature, right? And then the, the other thing that comes was, this was a really long conversation, and right now we're actually talking <laughs> through like 18 months, so I apologize. But the other thing that kind of came up with this was this notion of retreat. Mm -hmm. And communing with some of nature's most beautiful landscapes, nothing new. It's happened in so many iterations across time in different cultures. Uh, one of my colleagues actually was talking about um, court painters kind of retreating to the mountains and making landscape paintings. And juxtapose with, with Henry David Thoreau and, and his work, Walden, where he was living in, in I guess, as a rec recluse. But then also thinking about the, the ways that, especially here in California, we seek retreat um, from the city in the, some of the most beautiful landscape. And I was kind of wondering, in terms of that question of retreat, about how that connects both with nature and with technology. Um, so I think that we're always trying to think about like being unplugged and somehow that is part of like then where do we go? We go to nature. Um, and also this um, obsession around trying to have like tech wellness, you know, technology, detox. Um, so it's all part of the, the anxiety that we're all feeling, being so connected all the time. And we talked about the statistics of how often we check our phone and it's, you know, it, it increases every year um, so much that we're constantly staring at our phones, dis, you know, disconnected from reality, disconnected from our real um, day to day um, and imagining being elsewhere. Um, but I do think that all of us need um, a sense of going someplace, and I think nature is always seen as the go-to, but you can see these historic images both from you know, ancient um, scholars um, going off to mountain retreats or the famous um, Walden's you know, epic, mythic journey in the cabin, which is really a myth. It's a, it's a false um, idea. It's a, it's, a, it's a creation um, to lure us in that way. But I think there's some truth to it because I think as artists we also do residencies to like be in a different space and time to work. Um, you know, that's divorced from some of the burdens of our day-to-day. -day. And I, so I do think it's cultural that we do desire retreat constantly. Well, for me, in terms of like getting acclimated to the Bay Area, thinking about lifestyle and this mode of communing with nature and this retreat and hiking, it was so different than in New York where you're a little bit harder pressed to find those moments, whether it's because of the weather or proximity, but here it's actually part of the culture and, and the politics of it are, are, I don't even know how to describe. It's a place of privilege, let's just call it that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so in starting the project, I actually am really curious about materials and we were talking about this. How do you, how do you start when you have materials versus when you don't? Right, so I always have the challenge because I need thousands of materials, if not a couple hundred at least. Um, so instead, um, while that 
process is going, um, and we're trying to collect the materials. Um, this is an example of just the, the simple collaging process. So I am, again, using the internet to mine and print out all these uh, pictures of phones that I would like to have as examples of the inventory that's possible. Um, and then really in the old school analog way, literally cutting out each of these things and having them all over my table and pasting them. Um, I love collage as a, as a way of exploring ideas and forms uh, before I move into sculpture. And here you actually have <laughs> the first kind of shipment of phones. In but your suitcase when you In my suitcase when <laughs> I brought over. it. But also like uh, something in terms of thinking about sculpture and thinking about your work and how you process this, what roles does touch play? Because I, I, I was observing her going through the phones, ordering them, and, and feeling them, which as a non-artist, non mm. it seemed weird, but then I thought about it and I was like, oh yeah, it's intuitive, but it's, I don't know how to make sense of it. So mm. what? I don't even think I know, know that I do that. <laughs> Um, whenever I get something, I'm always organizing them, trying to figure out inventory and patterning and figure out like, oh, these are the iPhones here and these are the Android phones here, these are the flip phones. I'm constantly rearranging things. Um, and I think it's just kind of part of my DNA to be able to do that. So yes, you're touching them and there's a pleasure in that. Um, but these phones are incredibly tactile. I mean, they're personal devices. We touch them all the time. Uh, they're in our pockets. They're in our purses. I mean, they're literally in our faces, <laughs> on our <laughs> hands and necks and uh, mouths. You know, they're so intimate. Um, mm. So it's strange to touch someone else's phone, even though there's completely just a phone. And so in terms of material, though, because I'm not just talking about phones, but each project you use a different material and you f I guess how do you forge a relationship with that specific material for that specific project is is there something consistent about it or is every time different each time it's different I, I do think um, I am trying to find this balance between what the material inherently wants to do and what I want it to perform, you know? And so um, when you have a smartphone, that whole, you know, black mirrored screen, I mean, so I would totally want to go into that, you know? And then the other ones with the flip phone, it's like, oh, there's a top and it opens and the, all these buttons. So I want to enhance some of those qualities. Um, so each one is different. And like we were playing with the chords and it naturally has a curve, right? So I want to respect its inherent properties, even though it's going to become something incredibly different in the larger scale. So we're just going to go through a bunch of slides right now about the making of, and, and um, here, this is actually your studio where these, these forms were built. Yeah, I mean, it's a very labor-intensive process trying to figure out the technical aspects of how to uh, make these pho phones become these, quote, um, scholars' rocks, um, these boulders, part of this kind of ecological landscape that I wanted to talk about. Um, so building the armature, um, drilling the phones, and creating the armatures um, in place. Um, and then uh, the resin work. Um, in the next slide, I think um, we have some assistants um, who's been hired on to really master the resin work with me. Um, and again, just incredible uh, tactile process um, of transformation. And here they're standing in all their glory waiting to make their trip. I, yeah, I feel like they're in their empty country retreat before they <laughs> arrive into the gallery because they look very, like, oh, zen and minimal. <laughs> but I think what you'll experience in the gallery itself is that we've added a whole other layer uh, with the cables. Yeah. Uh, in the gallery, so we actually, like, at this moment, we're talking about title. And for these three, three sculptures, you titled them huddled masses. And I was, there's so many ways to interpret that title and I'm kind of curious the significance of it or where it started from. 
Mm -hmm. So I have to tell you that as we're having our weekly conversations, uh, of course, my husband, um, who's always been sort of my um, back of house collaborator on all of these, whether he likes it or doesn't like it, he's been watching these things happen. And um, he kept saying they're very figurative. And I was like, they're figurative. I'm trying to make a landscape. <laughs> and he was like, don't contradict me. And he's like, they're really figurative. I had no idea. They just seem like these figures, you know, and that really struck me, you know. Um, so I kept thinking about them and, and thinking like, yeah, they're like these shrouds, you know. And then as we were making these like gestures, I was like, oh, it's like we're looking at our iPhone. <laughs> You know, we're, and then, you know, you commute and everyone's doing this, you know, so I just realized this is our new body is like we're con kind of hunched over, you know, looking down at this little triangle. And so this um, started to have figuration um, without my knowing it, um, that they seem to look like, you know, you know, the mother or the father, or the adolescent, you know, um, so it started to create a family in some strange way. Um, and then um, this title um, came up and I think it's a it's somewhat of a loaded title, um, but I also thought in terms of like, what does it mean? These these masses, all of us on our phones. I mean, you look at the New York subway and it's like, oh, everyone's down. I mean, on the street here, everyone's waiting for the Uber or the Lyft. It's like, oh, everyone's waiting for their phone. So I just felt like this was kind of um, uh, our humanity, you know, and, and feeling that uh, maybe we need to be freed of it, you know, um, and the sense of freedom that we used to once feel about having a mobile phone, and yet now we're so attached um, and it's almost imprisoning us and that we don't feel as um, free to be mm. in our upright postures, you know. <laughs> we're sort of constantly reverting back to the centrality of the phone taking over. Well, I'm also kind of curious because the phone is a unit or a phone is an object as something really personal to us and, and, and having significance or, or a material culture to each individual versus these donations of old discarded phones. And I guess what gives a phone life? Like, Well, I think it's all being powered up, right? <laughs> like I don't think people feel very nostalgic about a, a, a dead phone or a phone that doesn't have battery. <laughs> Um, so I think it's all being powered up, and so I did want to call empathy. Um, this exhibition has, like, you know, we were talking about, like, the technology show that has nothing that lights up, nothing that gets plugged no in. I mean, it's incredibly ironic. Um, and so I did kind of think, well, we're looking at these shells of technology once live that doesn't work anymore, and what does it feel like? Um, and so, in some way, one of the surprises were just how emotional people um, responded to the exhibition. Hmm. Um, so, it's a question, um, are we attached to these things? And in some way, I suspect no, but maybe the answer is actually maybe so. We're, we look at these and um, we're incredibly attached to our history. Um, Mark, you talked about like, the question of like, do you remember when you had your first phone? And I think that's like, you know, conjuring up what was that first phone? It's like the first kiss, the first love. It's like the first anything, you know? And you just feel completely like a high remembering this moment. Uh, and it's very nostalgic now, right? Because like how many because phones have you had in like the last five years? So many, I can't even count how many iPhones I've gone through, right? <laughs> And then the e-bundles. This is one of the other parts of the installation. Yeah, thankfully. I mean, a lot of this exhibition came out of trust. Um, you and me trusting each other to go on this adventure. And um, then uh, I wanted to have a local presence as well. And so I wanted it to also activate um, uh, local artists. And so this is a chance to kind of hand it off uh, to an incredible artist that you introduced me to. So Jamie took charge of um, project managing these e-bundles. And then um, we invited our colleagues to invite students to be part of the production. Um, and so I love the label uh, labor that's happened, but really out of care. And, um, and as I suspected, when we write, pick the right people and invite um, a, a network of community um, who's involved in um, 
this place. Um, not only are they making sculptures, but they're making community and sharing time and space. And, and I thought that was really important. Um, although the funny part is that you and I were doing it digitally. <laughs> And then you're activating something on a physical level and, and, and having that real-time shared experience. Uh, so we actually invite you to actually see the exhibition downstairs so it's now open. And then the final part are the chords, which I don't know if you want to say anything about this because it was probably the freshest part of the installation that just yeah, finished. It, it was a nice surprise because I've worked so hard on building those sculptures um, in New York and then, um, you know, offhand knowing what was happening locally. So uh, this installation that I did on site um, really depended on what materials we got um, in the last couple of weeks and how we could quickly process them. Um, but I also knew enough about this that I wanted to create this wave, this ocean, this sense of like uh, fluid um, uh, floor. Um, and really just looking in terms of like, this isn't just impacting our, our land, but it's really uh, the toxicity that's happening in our oceans as well. Um, and uh, I think they're both, um, menacing in some way like someone was just you were describing how just looking at chords thinking about their entanglement and you know we just seem to have so many chords under our desk and our lives constantly um, and that gives us a lot of anxiety uh, just in itself but the way they flow just makes us think of water and water is one of those places we go to to mm -hmm. calm ourselves the sound of it the color of it all of it so um, it's it's again a paradox and I think now is the time that I stop talking, which is a relief for me, and actually open it up for questions. So I can run around. If anybody has any questions, I, I can hand the mic over. I also wanted to mention that now we're looking at those um, e-bundles. So inside the e-bundles um, are um, laptops and external drives that people, individuals gave to us, um, which I know some of you guys are in the room. So thank you so much for entrusting us with your data and with your precious laptops. I know it's hard to imagine giving it away. Um, but so what we did was entangle them and entomb them with these um, ethernet cables. And so it really is preserving them in the old fashioned way, um, as opposed to assuming that just because it lives in the cloud, it can't be uh, accessible. Um, so that's what you get to sit on in the exhibition as a place to pause and sit in the gallery. Hi, Jean. Um, when you get a commission, do you start thinking about the project based on where it's going to go? Or what, what's the process? What comes first? So the commission would be an invitation, like a dialogue with a curator. That's uh, correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so depending on their institution. So I start with the place. You know, but I'm also interested in the dialogue that I'm having with this individual and uh, um, what that might mean. Um, so both in, in conversation with uh, this partnership, right, and um, the institution at large, but it really is the individuals who I'm working with, you know. And then it's really research. Um, what am I interested in? I'm in thinking about the audience, the people who are coming. Um, so what is the audience that they have currently? Um, how could my work resonate with that? What is the audience that they don't have? How can we extend that audience to different audiences? You know, So in some way, this project does tap into the history of Asian art. And so those landscapes are provo evocative of things that are, are in their collections imagery, for sure. Um, so it taps into that. But someone else, we were talking about the tech culture. Um, uh, there was someone younger who was like, that is so my world. <laughs> And, you know, as a teenager, it's like phones, you know, and I was like, you don't even remember the flip phones. You just lived in the, you know, <laughs> the smartphone era. So it's just interesting to think about the different communities that we can bring in that may not um, feel welcomed, you know, in this. Um, and then certainly we were talking about the people who were doing um, the e-waste recycling. You know, it's like they don't think about coming to a, a show about the work that they do. And I think that's an important component. Thank you.
Any other final questions? Hi, did you conceive any model for the landscape? You mean like an actual uh, specific? Yeah, model. Uh, so you want it to represent for the landscape, or is it uh, just imaginary? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly looked at lots of landscapes, and there's um, my personal experience having looked at and traveled across the world. Um, but they're not. I'm not replicating or trying to represent them. Uh, I'm thinking more holistically about our obsession with nature and the various. Um, models that are out there, um, so it's an imagined one. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I just want to mention that when I uh, met your, uh, the, the three, um, the <laughs> complex, um, it just reminded me of uh, the Gumgangsan um, <laughs> landscape, so uh, I was wondered if you have that kind of uh, um, it, East Asian landscape, uh, traditional landscape in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've traveled through so many of, um, you know, through Korea, Japan, China, Thailand, you know, um, Cambodia. I've seen so many beautiful landscapes that it evokes, uh, just literally brings tears to my eye. But I've also looked at a lot of, um, like, Chinese landscape painting, Korean ink drawing, you know, so there are also replicating but idealizing those landscapes um, in history. Um, so it's all of that at the same time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so one more, one more question. Um, awesome. Uh, this is interesting to see. Um, I had a, uh, I was really caught by your comment on how um, intimate phones are and how uh, seeing somebody else touch your phone, especially without consent, is like a violation <laughs> that is often worse than like a physical violation these days. Um, and, and yet, uh, in your work on um, the slide collection going into the cloud, uh, as, we, as we move through phones and keep upgrading, um, it does seem like the amount of intimacy we feel towards our own old phones is significantly reduced. It might evoke memories of a previous time that feels intimate, but I don't have a, a, a physical reaction to somebody picking up a discarded iPhone I used to use. Um, do you think that we've uploaded intimacy into the cloud and we've virtualized intimacy? <laughs> do you? I, I, think, I think we did. I think we, we might be. Uh, well, I think that Maybe I am asking us to be aware of that. And are we by choice? Um, are we d by design, you know? Um, or are we doing it consciously? You know, is that what we want? You know, and so, so much of my uh, conversation has been like technology is with us, right? But so are we, and what are the decisions that we want to make, right? And it's true. like. Technology has allowed so many relationships to thrive that can't be close. That's amazing, right? And it's very intimate. But at the same time, it does not replace like literally holding someone's hand. I mean, that's true too, right? Um, and just being f physically with someone uh, in their presence is really important. And I think that's a reminder that yes, it could be, but it's also not a replacement of. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I guess, oh, well, we have one more, one more. Okay, I can't say no to Nick. Thank you. Um, all right, so from early on, your previous body of work, you focus on a certain object, lottery tickets or cell phone or sweaters. Are they still alive in your studio practice? Like you look at maybe leftover lottery ticket, leftover slides, sweaters, are they still alive? They have po more possibility, more potential in your future work or it's kind of like done, move on to next? 
Um, they're. Uh, Are you attached to them? I am attached to them. Well, okay. There's the physical limitations of my studio, <laughs> right? So I do have to pack them away and then move them really out of the space if I'm not working with them. But they're in my mind, and I'm always thinking of new ways to go back to certain materials that I know intimately. I may not go exactly back to a sweater, um, but there's another project that makes me think of going. To something adjacent to it, right? Um, I, I, that project will live on because if someone wants to show it, I activate it, and the city comes alive, and the whole network comes alive. So, some of them do that. The same thing with a lot of tickets. You know, if you want to show them, they come out of the studio. Um, but I do think I do keep um, a lot of materials in my mind. Um, but I do have to limit, like. You know, if someone offered me seven pallets of e-waste, I'd be like, "Let me find the project space first <laughs> before saying yes to all that." Um, so it's just a lo logistical uh, question for me. But um, I would say I'm attached to materials, but not to hoard them. Um, I do love the transfer, but I do think for me it's just like going through the experience of touching them, inventorying, giving them care, organization, and then I would love to pass them on. <laughs> um, I don't have to live with them every day because for me, I've already had that experience with them. Um, but I think that when the Philadelphia Museum um, recently, you know, last year put together like six, six installations and I got to revisit all this work that was in storage and they came out. I mean, I was almost crying because every material brought me back to a place when I was making them with the people I was making them with and all that stuff and the people who donated. So it's incredibly viscerally moving to stand by those works. But it's like seeing your children again, right? Or, or your favorite shirt or whatever, your favorite shoes or house, you know, like whatever that is, you go back to that place and being in the physical uh, um, presence of it, I think is incredibly impactful. And I, I honor that. Well, um, if you join me in thanking Jean for tonight's program. Uh,